The first approach is to see the living standard as some notion of economic opulence. And it is to this approach that the GDP as a measure belongs. We have to distinguish here between two types of criticism of GDP. One type of critique concentrates on the foundational problems of seeing living standards simply as economic opulence. That's the basic question. I postpone a discussion of this issue to separate out more log logistic criticism that the use of GDP as an approach tends to generate. There are many omissions in the GDP as it is standardly measured. For example, tran transactions within the family and among friends, which are not priced and uh, nor seen in terms of markets, are not included in the GDP. As has been famously remarked, if a man ends up marrying his cook, who may be a female cook, if he marries her, then the GDP immediately falls down as it is standardly measured. Since her salary is no longer included in GDP, it becomes part of the unaccounted sector which GDP ignores. What the Commission did was to correct these, and there are many such, arbitrary exclusions and to get a much better measure of the GDP, taking into account non-market transactions. This, by the way, is a big issue, rightly, in the main currents of feminist economics, since women often provide unpaid labor within the family. And I might mention here, it took me some time to get over my amazement to see that of the statistic that we had in late 80s, we were looking at unpaid labor provided in the family, Italy had highest female unpaid labor in the world, compared with every other country in Europe, Asia, and Africa to which data was available. So that is a big issue in Italy and not to be ignored. And correcting other omissions and mismeasurements that the old GDP tended to make. The rectified GDP certainly becomes a better measure of the opulent aspect of living standards. But that, of course, still leaves open the question as to whether opulent is itself an adequate way of seeing the standard of living of persons. As I mentioned before, I shall come back to the foundational question of the inadequacy of the opulence approach presently. But before that, let me comment briefly on the second approach, that of happiness. The approach sees living standard as some notion of the happiness of a person. And this belongs to the classical utilitarian tradition on which the assessment of living standard is identified with that of the evaluation of the happiness that people respectively enjoy. Here too we should distinguish between two types of criticisms that can be and have been made. One, light of, one line of critique questions whether happiness can be measured in a way that would be useful. And no less importantly, and this has been a big issue in economics, whether the happiness of one person can be compared with that of another. The early utilitarians did not seem to find much problem in such quote-unquote interpersonal comparisons of happiness or utilities of different people. And Bentham and Sidgwick and Marshall and Edgeworth and Pigou went about applying the happiness perspective with, without much hesitation, without questioning at all the interpersonal comparability of people, uh, different people's happiness. But this approach came under severe criticism in the 1930s, particularly dealt by Lionel Robbins and particularly fed by the main currents of the then positivist philosophy, logical positivism was the dominant philosophy at that time. Even though I am really quite skeptical of, ge of the general approach of measuring living, living standard to some kind of an index of happiness, and I will presently say, talk about that, I must argue that more difficulty was seen in making interpersonal comparison than could be justified. We cannot, of course, measure happiness with great precision, but nothing in the measurement of living standard can be extremely precise. 
And in more actually, and sometimes people confuse these things. They think that somehow mathematics is asking for more precision. That's not the case. Mathematics allows you to have partial ordering, allows you to have fuzzy sets, and in all kinds of ways, ambiguities could be captured within a mathematical framework. It's not the fault of the mathematics that this uh, premature precision issue comes up. In more recent years, interesting work has been done by a number of economists, including, as it happened, two members of the commission appointed by President Sarkozy, who worked with us, namely Daniel Kahneman and Alan, Alan Kruger, and others not in the commission, for example, Richard Layard. And the problem of evaluation of happiness and that of making interpersonal comparisons have been to a great extent demystified. So the Commission made room for this type of reformed, happiness-based approach among the three large avenues that we explored. But I remind you again here that this leaves the bigger foundational issue, that of the viability of the general approach of happiness as a guide to living standard. And that is still open to argument and to which I will return. So let me recollect now where we have got so far. I've identified three different approaches to the evaluation of living standard, an identification which I did more in 1984 and which caused some debate at that time, but it seems to be now fairly well accepted, and related to that, the assessment of aggregate performance of a society. The old GDP approach can be improved by eliminating omissions that create problems within GDP's own discipline. And the old happiness approach can also be improved by better addressing the problem of measurement and interpersonal comparisons of happiness. The GDP-based approach, as well as the happiness-based approach to social measurement, both have been given room within the plurality of indicators that the Commission has presented to the world. Indeed, we followed all three of the approaches that I outlined. We included them all. The foundational comparisons of three approaches, however, remain to be discussed today. And to that important exercise, I now turn. I should make it clear here that the analysis that follows is not that of the Commission, nor that of my. I know that the Commission is sometimes called Stiglitz and Fitusi Commission, that's the standard official name. I'm not speaking as a member of the, the Stiglitz and Fitusi Commission, I'm speaking as me. Uh, but I, I'm not disowning anything in the Commission's report because it was right, given the plurality of views in the Commission, for us to have a plural approach. But that, of course, doesn't mean that I don't have my own views, and that's what I'm going to discuss now. So I want to make the context clear. Um, now, um, um, the, as an individual economist, I have to present what I think of the three approaches. Uh, indeed, the Commission, of course, was quite convinced that we should treat uh, its report as a springboard for further reflection and analysis. So I'm not going against the, the spirit of the Commission that Sarkozy appointed, because he thought that this was the beginning rather than the end of the discussion on this subject. So what should we make of these three approaches, beginning with the happiness-based approach? Let me take that first. I would argue that it's a very, very limited approach to social ethics. There are two distinct problems here, not connected with interpersonal comparisons of happiness, which so beguiled the economists for a long time. 